I don't know if this is a waste of your time then, but I, I, I thought I might as well share it. So here, this is the last version that I had up and, and going, uh, posted in Blackboard. So if I was going to start new migrations, I could just come see I've got a whole bunch of separate ones, initial history, appointment, and so on. I can delete the whole folder. Okay. I can come down. I can delete the databases. Oh, I don't have it because this is, I just unzipped it. I had never run, so I don't have the database. But if it was there, I'd just select it and delete it, right? Yeah. And then it's just a matter of uh, going in and, and running my commands again. So I can just pull them up here for my common commands. And this will just recreate it, right? Yeah. I've tried. I've tried using those lines, and like switch MOM migrations to CM migrations. Right. But uh, it just says build failed no matter. Oh, well, then there might there be a the build error manager. then, right? So sometimes it doesn't tell you what the build error is right away. So I'll go and separately do a build, and you know, do a build, a rebuild and then see what the build errors are because that can prevent you from doing this because the build has to succeed before uh, this package manager command will actually successfully run. Um, oh, because I have the error with alcohol, that might be why. That's probably it, yeah. So if there's uh, some other thing causing the build to fail, then you won't be able to successfully re-add a migration, right? Mm, but just okay. to, to finish and... what I was talking about here then, you notice that when I go to the migrations, I just have one but this initial migration will have the combined changes that I previously had three migrations sitting there, right? So it's just really combined it all into a single migration. I haven't lost any of the changes because this has been generated based on the current state of the model of the system. So sorry for get, getting off track from your question there, but I just wanted to finish. That's why I went to that demonstration is I've combined three separate migrations down into one, but I haven't lost anything. This migration will describe the current model for the overall application completely based on all the changes I've made to the actual models themselves and so on, right? So yeah, if you're not able to actually follow those steps and do that, odds are that your build is causing some error. So you have to just get that figured out first, then you'll be able to complete this and recreate your migration. So you think because I had an error in my rebuild, that's probably why I wouldn't? Yeah. Definitely, that, that's oh, almost oh. certainly it, yeah. Okay. okay. And just one more question. Sure. If that's okay. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering the difference between, like, the first ad migration to application DB context and, the, like, the second one ad migration. Because uh, those two sets. Well, the, uh, well, maybe I'll answer it this way. Like, if I have not made any changes that affect the model, like, I can make some changes in here. Like, if I come in here and uh, uh, you know wanted to change an annotation, for example, right? I mean, think, oh, well, I've got to go and make a new migration now, right? So let me just save that. I come down here. I can bring up the same command that I did a moment ago to add this migration. I might think I need a new migration, right? Now, of course, I'm going to get an error now because I can't reuse the same name. So it's going to give me an error. Oh, initial was used. So let me bring up the command, make a, a new migration. It will make it, but you notice it's empty, right? Because there were no actual changes required or called for. So in that case, you know, there's no harm, but I don't need this migration. Now, does that help answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So I, I can just delete it. Because it's an empty migration, I can just delete it, and there's nothing lost, okay? Yeah, so you know, you might end up with a whole series of subsequent migrations if there really is no change, you know, uh, in the actual database that's required from a model change that you've made. Then you know, actually, it'll just scaffold an empty migration like that. Okay, I'm just going to put that back. Okay. That's an example of something that doesn't affect the model. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm just looking at the chat window here. Uh, so okay, uh, Caleb figured it out. He forgot to assign capacity. Okay, very good. All right. Yeah, that, that's a great, uh, great thing. That loop there to go through and actually look at all the, uh, 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 the actual errors. Right. Good. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you, everybody. Any, any more questions before we get into the actual 
meat and the potatoes of it for today. Okay, well, I'm looking forward to today because we're finally, we, we've done some work in the last few lectures uh, working together, adding first of all the, the filtering and then the uh, sorting, right? And so finally, the third part of this is the actual paging as well. Paging is very important, as you can see, when you start getting a large number of records, we really do need to uh, implement this. And uh, on a, in a lot of the online tutorials, what they have you do is stick a, a link, an actual link at the top of the column and use it for paging. But this is a slightly different approach because we're gonna use buttons, as I see here, instead of links. And that gives the advantage that we can integrate it, integrate this approach into uh, the ones that we've been doing already, right? Uh, so that's with the uh, 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 sorting and filtering, so it'll all tie in together, and eventually we'll be able to persist the current status of the page, right? So we can actually return to the page later on, being on the same page number with the same filter and the same sort as when we left it. So that's our ultimate goal, and we'll get that done today, hopefully, right? But to get it done, uh, some of you had an introduction to partial views, so I wanna talk a bit about that already. So a partial view is, it's essentially like a, a snippet of HTML, but it's much more than that, right? A partial view, why it's different is it actually has access to the uh, uh, view data and the model of the parent view that you're inserting this into, right? So it allows us to actually have a little snippet of code that we uh, can insert into the view that has its own model, potentially, as well as it has access to all the data in the view itself. So it's like a miniature web page on steroids, so to speak, that gets incorporated into the main page, right? So we'll be using partial views and, and putting them into practice. We'll also, of course, be using Bootstrap for our pagination. So I have a link here that you can read all about that. Now, again, some of this uh, encourage you to use links, okay? And some, uh, the approach we're gonna use is gonna specifically using buttons, but the effect and the look of it is gonna be the same in the end. And we'll finally ac actually as well get the chance to have a reason to use the Bootstrap modal. One of my favorite little features in Bootstrap, there's a little pop-up dialog box. I think there's one down here I can click to launch a live demo, right? So, you know, we're gonna use it right now. Our goal is to use this uh, to give a way that the user can pop up and change their page size. Once they decide they wanna be able to say on this uh, page, I wanna see five records or 10 records per page, right? So it'll be our first chance to use the modal. But later on, we'll be using this for other things. In fact, we can actually eventually, without leaving the page, have this pop up to say, add a new record, right? Or even edit a record and so on, right? But for now, it's just gonna be used to uh, uh, give us the ability to change our page size. All right, so that's a bit of an introduction to what we're gonna do. So I have my copy paste files here. Uh, the 8A, right, we're just gonna get some basic paging in place. So you can feel free to follow along. And I have the, the code file up and ready to go. So you, know, you can grab a copy of it yourself. The link for it is right there. Any final questions before we get started? All right, so I have my Visual Studio open. This is where we left the project off at the end of step 7B, right? Okay, so as I said, you know, we're gonna use buttons. It makes it more reusable without requiring customization for each view, this approach, right? Uh, some of the online tutorials, they actually have to go into the page and controls on each page and make changes to them. Whereas this, we'll be able to stick it in a partial view and just stick it on any page and away it goes. So one of the things that is common though, one of the first things we're gonna add is a new class, and this is right from the Microsoft tutorial, right? This paginated list, okay? So there's nothing special about it that is different, right? So this is gonna be the first one, but when we often add these sort of helpers or utility classes, I like to keep them organized. So the first thing I'm gonna do is right click and add a new folder. So I'm gonna just call it utilities. If you, want, if you like the word helpers better, then feel free to use that. It doesn't really matter. Just the namespace will take care of it, right? And then I'm gonna add a class, okay? Which will be our paginated class, paginated list, right? So as I said, this is just right out of the online tutorial from Microsoft on, on doing this kind of paging. Okay. 
So basically, you know, what do we have here? We have some properties I can ask. Does it have a previous page? Does it have a next page? And we're going to use that to disable and enable buttons so you can't click on a button to go to the next page if there isn't one and so on, right? And we have our internal variables here for our page index and total pages, right? Our constructor, it helps us get things in place, but the bulk of it is down here. So basically, you know, we're just going to, you know, skip and count our way through uh, our actual source list, our iQueryable, right, as we go and get the data. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this. It's something we just kind of plug in and use, right? And then now we have that in place. Now we can actually start making use of it. So uh, I'm going to focus on, let me just close everything else up here to clean up the screen so we can focus on what we're doing. We'll use patients as our example. So I'll get the patient's controller. And at the same time, I might as well get the patient index, right? So we'll come down here to views, patients, and get the index. Go, we'll be going back and forth between these two, uh, getting our paging in place, right? So starting in the controller, right now we've already added a number of parameters here to the index action. We have our search string, okay, the other ones for uh, the different filters. And then these ones are all what we added when we came to do sorting, right? So somewhere in here, I need to add a nullable integer for the page. Oh, I've got my comma in the wrong place, okay? All right. So it needs to be a nullable int because on the first request, we're not going to specify a page, right? But that's okay. We'll be able to handle that uh, exactly, right? Okay, now at some point though, we probably do need to reset the page back to the beginning. And if you think about it, that makes sense whenever we change either the sort order or the filter. Like if you're on page 37 of 143, right? And you change the sort order, well, it doesn't make any sense to try and stay on page 137, right? You wanna go back to page one. Same if, thing if you would change the filter. So where does that happen? Well, probably the best place to capture that is down here, right? Where, okay, before we sort, uh, we're gonna check if we've changed, ask for a change of filtering or sorting, right? So right in here, I think is a, is a good spot to just reset our page back to page one, right? So I'll just put this little bit of code in for my copy paste file. I'll just assign page equal to one, okay? Reset to the start because we're here because an action button was clicked, right? Now, so far, we've seen that we have just one action button, right? Uh, well, actually, no, I guess there's two, but anyway, uh, the one for the filter. We're gonna create some more action buttons. That's what we're gonna do on the top of each column. So when you click a column heading to for, uh, sort by that column, that will be yet another action button, right? So any one of the action buttons will cause us to set our page number back to one. Okay, and then uh, right down here, just before we're gonna go back and actually redisplay the view, right? after doing all the other work we've done in preparing to show the right data, here is where then I'm going to make use of our paginated list class, right, that we added earlier, okay? I have to set my page size, so I'm gonna start off with a hard-coded assumption. You could just live with this if you want all pages to have the same page size, right? Or, and you could change it to a different value if you want, but later on we'll add the ability to let the user dynamically choose a page size. Okay, and now here I'm gonna go get my page data, right? Using the paginated list where I pass in the class for the uh, generic type that I wanna work with. So obviously the patient class, because I'm in the patient's controller, right? And then we pass the actual query. Now remember, up to this point, it's still an iQueryable, right? Which is why we've been able to dynamically add new where clauses, sort order by clauses and so on, right? but it's not till we get down to the bottom here that we actually execute the query. By the way, a student asked about the ASNO tracking. I already have it up earlier, but it doesn't hurt to have it here again, okay? It doesn't do any harm. It just guarantees I don't forget <laughs> if I didn't have it earlier. And I'm just pulling data, so it makes sense to make sure that we don't add all the tracking data, right? Because we're just creating a big long list of data to display, okay? Then we pass in our page number. Now, if it's null, we'll just use one. Right, that's what this does for us. And then we specify our page size. So that gives us our page data. So in the end, last change to make here is take this out and just put in page data. Yep. 
fell it, right? It would help page data, right? And there we go. Now we'll just return the page data and uh, that's what we'll actually give to the view. So in the view, there's a bit of work to do, but some of it we already have done, right? In order to use buttons at the top of each column, I have to make sure I'm inside a form. Check, we already have that in place because of the earlier work we did. If I didn't, I could just add it now, right? So yeah, everything is wrapped in a form. And even after we added sorting, remember we put the entire table inside the form as well. Good, so that is taken care of, right? So right at the end, so after the end of the table and before the form, here's where I'm going to get ready to show the navigation bar for paging. And that's using this partial view tag, right? I can just say partial, and the name is the name of my partial view. This is that snippet of HTML that we're going to insert into the page. All right, so I have some notes explaining here. If you didn't ha have a chance to look at partial views yet, I know some of you did and some didn't, okay? It's really just a special view renders a portion of view content, right? Uh, it helps to reduce code duplication because we often have same sort of snippet of code we want to put in multiple views, right? So it's a good way to optimize our efficiency as a programmer and cut down the rep repetition of duplicate code as well, right? But it's more than a snippet of HTML because it gives us access to the data of the parent, okay? And then uh, it can actually be a strongly typed partial view with its own model as well, right? Now, where do we put them? Okay, that's something I'm going to talk about for a second. So I want to make this partial view called paging navbar, but the question is, where do I put it? Well, let me talk about that for a second. Right now, I'm working in the patient's controller. So if I, with this line of code here, what the system is going to do is it's going to naturally come and look in the views patients folder. And does it have a matching view with this name? No, it doesn't. So then it goes on and looks in the shared folder, right? So the bottom line is if you have a partial view that is only going to be used, right, in, for example, in relation to doctors or appointments or patients, then by all means, go ahead and put it inside the view folder corresponding to that controller, right? But I'm hoping eventually I might want to reuse this for multiple okay, entities in the system, not just patients, but maybe doctors, appointments, and more, right? So in that case, I definitely would put it in the shared folder. And if you look carefully, you'll notice we already have a number of partial views in here. In fact, even our layout is a partial view. Okay, our login partial, that just gives us our little links in the upper right corner of our nav bar on the layout page to you know, click to log in and, and so on. Okay, there's a validation scripts partial that contained the scripts that we already looked at that are provided to give us the validation error messages and so on on edit and create pages and things like that. So this is the perfect spot to do it. So I'm going to right click, add a view. Right now, I can just select a razor view here, and in the dialog box that comes up, okay, here is where I can check off that this will be a partial view. Right now, the, the naming convention for partial views is that we start with that underscore. Now, unfortunately, with the fonts that I'm using here, <laughs> it doesn't actually show very well on the screen, but there actually is an underscore under in front of the name paging navbar. Don't worry, it will show up eventually. Now, I, I can just do it as an empty. I don't need any template. Just to note here the different choices of things like create and edit and so on, right? But I don't need any of that, so I'll just leave it as empty. All I have to do is click Add. And just uh, give it a moment here to uh, bake. All right. So it's empty, so there's nothing in here but some comments, to go, a link to go and see about uh, you know, how to get some further help and so on. I'm just going to take all that out and copy the code from my copy-paste file, and we'll talk about it once I get it in place here. All right. So first of all, jumping into the C-sharp world, into Razor code, I'm creating a couple variables, right? I'm taking advantage of that because our model now, because of we, it's a paginated list, right? It has these new properties, has previous page, has next page, right? So based on that, I can decide, do I want to include inside of this variable here, disabled equals disabled or just an empty string? So I can put that right in place and you see it being used down here in these different buttons. So I can disable buttons, right? Uh, depending if, I can't move backwards or can't move forwards in the paging, right? Because there are no more pages. 
right? That's a quick and easy way that I can disable these different buttons. So I have a page navigation, okay, nav here, and then an unordered list, and notice that each one is class page item. That's where that bootstrap styling is coming from, right? Okay, so each of those, each of these though is a button named submit, right? And the name is page, okay? And then the value is gonna be the page number to go to, right? So for the one that goes to the very first page, the value is one, right? Uh, for the second one, the name is page, the value is going to be our page index minus one, which essentially means go back one page, right? Uh, then down here, we have the opposite. So page index plus one will obviously take us to the next page. Jumping to total pages, well, that will go to the very last page, right? So that's how the actual values work to supply this name value pair when we click the button, right? And away we go. So the center one is a little special. What I'm doing here is I'm using the uh, uh, caption of the button, so to speak, to show me my page number one of however many pages there are, right? Later on, we'll actually find more that we can do here, but notice I have this disabled. There's no point trying to click it and have it do anything, right? But it does have the page link class here as well. So it looks consistent with the others. Okay, well, that's it, believe it or not. That's enough work to actually go and give it a try. All right, and here we are. So if I click patience, there we go. Now I see 10 per page. I have 18 pages, because I got lots of nice sample data. Notice my previous and first buttons are grayed out as I point, nothing happens. If I click next though, then I go to the page two, page three, I can jump to the last page, right? Previous page and so on. Of course, if I hover over here, right? Actually, no, there's no titles yet. That comes in the next step. step. <laughs> All right, but yeah, it's fully functioning. And that was pretty easy, wasn't it? To add paging, I could easily add it to the others and so on as well. All right, now. First thing that might occur to you is, well, you know, what about this business of the page size? We want to give the user the chance to change it, right? So that'll be our, our next step we're going to do. Yeah. All right. Uh, oh, I guess in my copy paste file, the first demo we're going to do next is this, see how easy it is to add this to doctors as well, right? So that's good. So we'll just come over to the doctors controller. I'll get that open, right? And then we'll also need the doctors view. But first of all, Coming here to the index, well, we need obviously our nullable int for page, right? And then we're going to use that. Okay, I'll just put the same code in here in the index action. Set my page 10, my page data. Okay, that's the same query I had basically down here, my underscore context, doctors, as no tracking, right? And so now I can just put page data inside of here. Of course, I would, often I would take time to actually break this out as a separate link expression first and then pass it in as a variable. But, you know, just to make this short and sweet, that's good enough. Now it's gonna pass the page data to the view. So what do I have to do in the view? Well, let's go to the doctor index view. All right, now notice that we don't have a form here yet because we haven't added any of these capabilities, right? So there hasn't been a need for a form. So that'll be the first thing I do is I'm gonna wrap the entire table here inside my form, right? I'll take the closing form tag and put it down here at the end after the table, right? There we go. A quick uh, reformat here should fix up the indentation. This doesn't always work. If anyone wants to tell me why it doesn't always work, I'd be happy to hear it, but there we go. So now I have it inside a form, right? What else do I have to do? I just have to add my partial view. So right at the bottom, just before the closing form tag, uh, the partial view, and believe it or not, that's it. Isn't that easy? That's so nice and reusable, right? I probably could have done that with a hot reload as well instead of actually stopping, but now I can page through and see all my, now I have, don't have sorting or filtering here, but at least I have paging and it's fully functional. Nice and easy, eh? Okay. All right, well, maybe to break it up, I'll stop and start the recording at this point.